All right, we're going to go over a story that everybody's familiar with, with David and King Saul and Goliath, but from a different kind of aspect that you may or may not have ever heard of before, but we've all experienced it sometimes because when we feel like we need to do something because God is leading us in a certain direction, someone always has an opinion about how it should be done. And when you come against obstacles, everyone around you will tell you how you need to handle those obstacles, even though most of them have never done it because they have been too afraid to confront that obstacle themselves. Wise counsel will come from those who have walked in victory, but most of the advice you will get are from those who haven't walked in that victory. We see in 1 Samuel 17 with David talking to Saul. The first thing David says is to let no one lose heart, a word of encouragement for all those in discouragement over their situation with the Philistines. But Saul tells David that David is just a young man. But Saul has been a warrior from his youth. But David responds that he has killed a lion and a bear and this Philistine will be like one of them. So the confidence is there, but we need to figure out why. And we will figure that out in a little bit. But Saul tries to convince David to wear his armor, the king's armor, because that is what Saul thinks will be the thing that protects David and how David should go into battle. So people will see a problem and think it can only be solved in one way. And usually they aren't even willing to solve it in that way. If they are so confident in their solution, why aren't they doing it? God has a way of doing things and man has a way of doing things, but don't settle for man's way. When you hear from other people on how to do something that they are too scared to do, it's convenient how their armor is just laying around. Why aren't they wearing their armor or walking in their anointing? It was convenient for Saul to give away his armor because he, as the king, as the one who was supposed to be leading his armies, it was convenient for him to give his armor away because he was too afraid to put it on. Saul wasn't walking in the anointing. He wasn't walking in his authority as king because he forgot his identity. He was quick to assume the identity of David as someone unqualified. It's hard to be confident in someone else's identity when you aren't even confident in your own. David knew his identity was in God. He communed with God while tending the sheep and after Taking down a lion and a bear, a giant was just another day of the week. He didn't have armor for the lion or the bear, and he wasn't surrounded by the Israelite army out in the field. But the crazy thing is David was surrounded by, well, it was supposed to be Israelite warriors, but it was really a bunch of Israelites playing dress up. They were posers. Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman wrote, The critical component that makes a veteran warrior is achieving success in real combat and then building upon the memories and lessons of past combat as well as past victories to create future confidence and success. So when I'm looking at David and King Saul, just because I know the ending of the story and seeing the big picture, I'm looking at two warriors. Saul was proven in battle. The Bible says that. He was a warrior, but instead of building upon his memories and lessons from past combat and past victories, he was hiding in his tent. Saul looks at David, and he doesn't see a warrior. But at that moment, David didn't see a warrior either, because a warrior wouldn't be hiding in his tent, in his house, in his church. But when I see David, I see a warrior because I know the story. I know he has fought a lion and a bear, and probably more than one of each. He was the youngest brother, so he probably had to fight off his older brothers growing up, and his father, Jesse, was ashamed of him, so Jesse probably let that happen between his brothers. So David has been a fighter his whole life. So you are looking at these two warriors who have both had victories, they have both had success, but only one of them had the confidence, and that's because of the confidence in God. David had confidence in God because that's where his identity was. Saul didn't have confidence in God because his identity wasn't in God. Now Saul, the one that was hiding, He was trying to put a physical, tangible armor on David because he didn't have confidence in God. But the one who was trying to fight the Philistine giant, the one who was not hiding, already had the armor of God on because David's confidence was in the one who gave him that armor. Funny thing is, when demonic spirits were tormenting Saul, that armor didn't do him any good. But guess who he called to play worship music to combat that? He called David. Now, when Goliath shows up and starts throwing insults at them and insulting God and challenging Saul and his army, it didn't offend Saul that Goliath was blaspheming God because that isn't where Saul's identity was found. But we see the opposite with David. David is confused when he hears Goliath dishonor God and nobody is doing anything about it. And David is ridiculed by his brothers who aren't doing anything. So since David was the only one willing to make a stand, everyone thought David was in the wrong. Everyone thought he was the crazy one because they weren't willing to stand for their God. They were irritated with David. Like so many Christians who sell out get irritated with sold out Christians. They will throw out all the things. You don't need to do that. 
All this isn't necessary. God understands if you sit this one out. There's always an excuse that goes with their passivity. They throw out all the things to get you to slow down or back down so you don't expose their cowardice. So you won't expose them hiding in their tent like Saul was. I heard one pastor say, God can use one person who stands better than 99 who run. I wonder if the brothers of David knew that David was going to respond. Like when they saw him in the camp, I wonder if they were trying to send him on his way as soon as possible. Another question that came from that thought was how long were these two armies camping across from one another? How many days went by with Goliath spewing insults to God and no so-called warriors stood up to shut him up? The Bible says it was 40 days, but David responded on the first day he stepped foot on the battlefront. I mean, David actually followed God, but the rest of the Israelites just followed Saul around. And it makes me think of the difference between actual Christ followers and simple churchgoers who just follow their leader, but never make a stand against giants in the land that insult God on a daily basis. These so-called Christians hide in their tents or let's just say they're pews. Once again, it goes back to identity. Your identity reveals the foundation. So if your identity is in the world, you will love the things of the world, your status, your job, money and entertainment and this and that and the other. That's where you spend all of your time. But if your identity is in Christ, you will love time with him in prayer and in his word and serving him by serving others like David did. So looking at these two warriors in the tent, you could see who was and who wasn't walking in the anointing. The identity boils down to the foundation. David spent all that time in the field praising and talking to God. It was David and the sheep. So he had opportunities to write psalms, I'm sure, and play music and write songs to God. And in that field, he found his identity in God. And Saul is over here like, Somebody got a word for me? He's always going to the prophet trying to get a word. I need a word. Searching the pews to find his affirmation and identity and a spoken word from a prophet instead of God. Saul's way doesn't work. David, when brought before the king, is probably thinking, why would I want to do it your way? Your way doesn't work. If your armor works, you go wear it. But if you read earlier in scripture about how Saul became king, Saul didn't want to be king. He hid. He had to be pursued to fulfill his calling. David was already walking in his calling. That armor, that anointing would have worked for Saul if he would have put on his armor and walked in his anointing as king, but he sent out a young man in David. He lost his identity as a warrior and king when he took off his armor. Now, when I was thinking about the children of Israel when going over this topic, I thought about four questions that parents should be asking their children, and these are questions that we as Christians need to be asking ourselves, and this is where we find out what our Heavenly Father has for us because this is how you find out. You ask. So the first question is, where am I going? And obviously parents need to know where their children are when they are young to keep them safe and accountable. So we as Christians need to know where we are going. So ask the father. So the second question is, who are we going with? And my parents were super strict. They had to meet the parents of the kids I was hanging out with, even if it was just two houses down. And I'm glad because that prevented a lot of bad things that could have happened. Third question, what am I going to do when I get there? And four, when am I coming home? These are important questions. David knew the answers to these questions. He knew exactly where he was going, who he was going to be with, what he was going to be doing, and when he was coming home. He was walking in obedience. You can't really ask those questions out of order because you don't know when you will be back until you know where you are going and what are you going to be doing when you get there. You can't ask God these questions about yourself and then leave the armor of God displayed as a decoration in your house. You have to find out the answers to these questions and have the armor on, ready to go where God wants you to go with the people God wants you to be with to do the thing he called you to do and come home after you have been obedient. People are waiting for you to be who you are called to be. There are people waiting for you to be obedient. These Israelites didn't know it, but they were waiting on David that day. The king needed David that day because he was walking in the armor of God. He was walking in his anointing, and he was walking in obedience. We are called to be a child of God. We are called to be obedient soldiers of God. They not only needed David for Goliath, but also for the rest of the Philistines. Goliath didn't fall, and it was just over. Goliath fell, and then the army of Israel had to chase down the Philistine army as they were retreating. They hunted them down, and he couldn't do that wearing the armor of Saul. If you weren't going against the devil face to face, you were probably going the same way he is. I think about Jesus coming into Jerusalem and all the people were celebrating because they had a plan for Jesus like Saul had a plan for David. 
Their plan for Jesus was that he was coming there to free them from Roman oppression. That was what made sense in their minds. That is how they wanted the battle to be won. The armor of Saul makes sense to the eyes, to the flesh, the tangible thing. But the closer Jesus got to Jerusalem, the farther away from their plan he was actually getting. People always look for a solution that makes sense to them, a plan that they understand. And all Saul understood was his armor that he had worn in past victories, but this was different. So it's not going to work for the one walking in the anointing. Now I do have a scripture here, and this is what it looks like in God's strength. In Zechariah 10, 5, it says, They shall be like mighty men who tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle. They shall fight because the Lord is with them, and the riders on horses shall be put to shame. And this scripture isn't talking about David, but this is what happened with David. He was obedient, and he said in 1 Samuel 17, 45, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. He was getting made fun of and being compared to a dog, but this is his response. He didn't say, I come with a sling and stone. That's not where he found his identity. That's where everyone else thought his identity was, and that's why they tried to cover him up with armor, because it made them feel better when they looked at him. It covered up what made them feel uncomfortable. But in this verse, we see where his identity was. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. That's the source, and that's the strength he was walking in, a strength that was not his own. David would not have gone out into battle without the Lord Almighty, because that is who made him mighty. Now, just think about Moses. He told God he would not go to Pharaoh unless God went with him. God is a God of glory, and you must understand what comes with glory. God made us worthy to give him all glory. Faith expects, and if you were not expecting, then you are living in doubt and unbelief. No, the little confidence that Saul had left was sitting in the corner of his tent. But David's confidence was being warned. His confidence was alive and with him. God was with David at the battle because David was with God every day in the field with the sheep, with the lion and the bear, and now with him leading up to the point of the battle. It wasn't cockiness because that is confidence in self. He had a confidence in God, which gives God glory. And honestly, Saul wasn't too fond of that. So he tried to give David his armor so he could get a piece of that glory from any type of victory. If Saul couldn't have the victory, I don't think he wanted anyone to have it all for themselves. And if you keep reading, you can see how jealous he gets when he hears songs about David. Saul wanted David dead after that. And O.S. Hawkins says, Many today believe that Jesus died on a cross in much the same way that we believe George Washington was the first president of the United States. They acknowledge that he existed as a real person. They simply do not trust their lives and eternal destiny to him. And that's where Saul was. He believed God existed, but he didn't trust his life and eternal destiny to him. And I point that to David and Saul because the wisdom of the world would try to explain the existence of everything. So God doesn't get any credit. Because if they don't understand it, they don't want you to have faith in it. And the one thing that grabbed me in this topic was we can't let something natural rob us from something spiritual or supernatural. The natural will want to take the credit like the armor of Saul threatens to do. We need to stand up. We need to be people that take down the first giant in an area because everyone else who wouldn't get in the fight because they were afraid, if they see giants start to fall, then they will jump in. That is what happened with the Israelites and the Philistines. The Israelites were too afraid until they saw Goliath fall, the thing that was tormenting them day and night. Once Goliath fell, they killed and scattered the Philistine army's bodies along the road all the way from Gath to Ekron. I don't know how far that is, but it's got to be miles. These tent dwellers today, pew sitters, as soon as they saw that the victory that comes from God was possible, they joined in. Stop sipping on milk and start eating the meat. Stop wearing the armor of Saul and put on the armor of God. David could have easily said that he was just there to deliver some food to his brothers. And this story made me think about Marshawn Lynch, the Hall of Fame running back that played for the Seattle Seahawks and he's a Super Bowl champion, and he used to come to the press conferences and say how he didn't want to be there, and he answered every question with, I'm just here so I don't get fined. I'm just here so I don't get fined. And it's funny, and Marshawn Lynch put in work for sure, but it reminded me of Christians today who don't, who just go to church, and when it's time to give and receive from God, they say, I'm just here because it's Sunday. But you're going to have to make a stand. You can't go with the majority 
who are too afraid to step out and be set apart. You can't stand with the majority if you are going to stand for God and with God like David did. The people are looking for a way to find freedom, but the world wants to offer tents to hide in through fear, to stay in bondage. The world will make it look like freedom because it makes it look like you are free from risk. But the people know something isn't right. The Israelites were free from facing off with Goliath, but Goliath had them in bondage to their fear, trapped in their own camp. They think they are surviving Goliath, who is keeping them there, just like many churches today are feeding into this and are trapped inside their four walls. So let's go back to 2020, 2021, even 2022. And I can't make this stuff up. Churches had signs that said, share love, wear a mask, not share Jesus. No, put on a face diaper, the armor of Saul that has been proven doesn't work by the science that so many worship that it was ineffective, but it made those living in fear comfortable. Hide in this tent. And the problem, the Goliath won't be a factor. It panders to insecurities. I'm not saying wearing one is wrong, but David would have looked like an idiot if he would have worn Saul's armor because it wasn't made for him. He didn't say, I come in the armor of Saul, not even in the name of King Saul, king of Israel's armies. David said he came in the name of the Lord of the armies of heaven. Don't settle for things that everyone else is going to lean on, but lean on God and lead and put on the armor of God. I heard some pastors post Jesus would have worn a mask when if you read in scripture in that society, no one was allowed to go near lepers because the disease could spread. But Jesus put his hands on lepers, embraced them, truly loved them, offered freedom, not a tent to hide in. Because true love offers freedom, not bondage to what the world offers. Well, now what it comes down to is this. You will surrender to one of two things. You will surrender to God and you can give him your life and he gives you victory and other victories through your obedience. Or you can surrender to what is in front of you because you are afraid of something you don't understand instead of having faith and fall on your face. And remember, the last time Saul wore his armor, he died a coward. Don't live a coward's life of hiding behind only what you understand in the moment, especially if whatever comes your way does not come in the name of the Lord. Don't put your confidence in the armor of Saul, but put your confidence in the name of the Lord as you deploy. In our Christian life, we must abandon passivity if we want to fulfill the great commission that Jesus gave us. But much of the church believes that we are stuck on this earth with Satan and they have raised their white flag of defeat to him. But if we would wave our white flag to Jesus, it would become a white flag of victory. And then we would realize that we are not stuck on this earth with Satan, but he is stuck on this earth with us, the army of God. In my book, White Flag of Victory, I discuss my time in combat and the parallels between warfare in the military and the warfare in the Christian life. If you'd like to add this to your library, you can find it on Amazon in the link in the description below. If you haven't surrendered your life to Christ and are ready to come to God, I would like to lead you in a prayer in just a moment. But first, I want to be clear. Praying a sinner's prayer is not a ticket into heaven. These are not magic words. You must follow Christ and live for him. You cannot receive salvation by your own merits, but by what Jesus has already done. Ask to receive the Holy Spirit, to be filled and experience what God has for you. You will not live the same life or be able to keep Jesus to yourself if you become a Christ follower. 1 John 2, 4 tells us that the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. Those commandments are to love God and to love others. If you love God, you will follow him, and if you truly love others, you will want others to experience God and give their lives to him as well. So if you are ready to pray, pray this. God, I ask for forgiveness. I believe Jesus died for me, and nothing I have done wrong is too great for the power of his blood that was shed for me. I am ready to forsake the world and live a changed life because I realize how much you love me. I love you, and I'm ready to live for you. If you made the decision to surrender your life to God and follow Jesus, I encourage you to spend time daily with him in prayer and reading his word and worshiping him for who he is. Much will be revealed to you in this time with him. Be a part of a community of believers to grow in the fullness of God and his word and join a church that does the same. Get involved and stay accountable to each other. Also, please let me know that you made this decision by emailing me at charliemike.me at gmail.com. Or message me on Facebook at facebook.com slash charliemikeinternational.